everyone. My name is Sianna Moreno and I am a student ambassador for Clovis Community College and today I'll just be bringing you another interview on the topic of Cinco de Mayo with Professor Dr. Fontes. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Dr. Fontes, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your day to tell us more about the French invasion of Mexico and the Battle of Puebla on the 5th of May in 1862. Um, so before I get started, can you tell me a little bit background about yourself and the work that you do? Yeah, so thank you, Sienna and Patrick for having me um, in another in interview. I really appreciate the time and effort you put into these um, interviews. I know it takes a lot of time. So um, I am a full-time professor of history at Columbus Community College. I received my BA and MA in history from Fresno State and my PhD in American history at Stanford University. Um, my work, I'm, I'm currently working on um, interviewing and researching and writing on the Chicano movement in the 1960s at Fresno State. I recently had a chapter published by the University of Arizona Press in an anthology of um, new voices of the, in the Chicano movement um, through UC Santa Barbara. My current chapters will be on, I'm working on, on the Brown Berets in Fresno in the 1960s and the lowrider scene in the late 60s and 70s in Fresno. So that's what I'm working on right now. Thank you for that, it was very interesting. So everyone keep an eye out for those chapters coming out by Dr. Fontes. I'm sure it'll display nothing but his amazing work and research. Um, but let's go ahead and start with the first question. So um, would you be able to briefly just mention um, what led to the French invasion of Mexico in 1861? Sure. Before that, I just wanted to say that there, in, in my in my examination of Cinco de Mayo and the celebration, there are four major stages to what we see it as a Cinco de, Cinco de Mayo um, celebration. One is the actual event, the actual events, like like all holidays. There's a kernel of truth somewhere, right? Like the Christmas story, the Easter story. There's there's truth somewhere, and over time, the myth, the legend, the celebration builds upon and grows and grows and grows. So there's the actual event. And then there's how Cinco de Mayo was celebrated subsequent to the event in the late 19th century in Mexico and the Southwest. The third stage is um, it happens as a consequence of the Mexican revolution when 10% of Mexico, a whole 10% of the Mexican population leaves Mexico and goes to the Al Norte, um, the United States. And when that happens, um, Cinco de Mayo is reinvented in places like Los Angeles, um, along the Texas border, and places like Fresno as, as, as a celebration for Mexican Americans to remember their Mexican heritage and history. Around the 1950s, it starts to wane and there's less uh, people showing up to Cinco de Mayo celebrations across the nation, the Southwest. In the 1960s, we see the fourth stage of Cinco de Mayo happen during the Chicano movement, a uh, movimiento in the 1960s in places like Fresno State, um, San Francisco State, and UCLA, as young Chicanos take up the holiday again for its rich significance of the David and Goliath battle, right? Um, um, this small group of, uh, of freedom fighters against overwhelming odds. And this is with how the Chicanos saw themselves in the 60s as they fought against social injustice and anti-Mexican racism. So that, those are the four stages as I see of Cinco de Mayo. Going back to the actual event, the early 19th century was a tumultuous time for Mexico as Mexico was attempting to, to establish its fledgling nation. We know that um, Mexico in 1810 cried out for independence and it wasn't until I believe 11 years later that Mexico actually gained independence um, from Spain. But that wasn't the end of, of the struggle from European powers and the struggle against the United States. We know in 1835, 1836, um, American immigrants into Texas um, acted as a catalyst for what we know as a Texas revolution and Mexico lost a great portion of their territory in Texas. That precipitated events that led to the Mexican-American War, 1846-1848, when a westward pushing United States conquered roughly half of American uh, Mexican territory and Mexico lost California, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, parts of Colorado and Wyoming and Oregon 
all to a Western expanding manifest destiny, United States. After that, there was a war between liberals and conservatives in Mexico. Um, conservatives roughly tied to, to, to Rome and the Pope and liberals who were more progressive forward thinking led by men like Benito Juarez. By this time, 1861, Mexico was deeply indebted because of the war with America and because of their, their civil war. They had borrowed money from the UK, France, and Spain. When Benito Juarez came to power in 1861, he put a, he put a halt to payments to these year, three European powers so that Mexico could have time to recuperate from its great debt. When he put a, this two-year halt on payments, this angered the UK, Spain, and France, and they met in London to, um, as a pact to, to, to try to get their money back from Mexico. And they all set sail to Mexico and led at Veracruz as an invasionary force. Mexico um, has talks with Spain and the UK. They go back home, but France decides to invade. Napoleon III, who is the nephew of Emperor Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, sees this as opportunity to invade Mexico and establish a new empire. And of course, he does this while America is in its first year of the Civil War. He knows that America can't intervene and stop his intentions. And so the French land at Veracruz and march inward. Veracruz, the same place that Hernan Cortez lands in 1519, and Hernan Cortez is the one who actually gave it the name, right? Veracruz, the Truth Cross. And so he marches inward toward Mexico City and um, he's, he's successful, this general is successful, French general successful as he marches inward toward Mexico City until he comes to Puebla. Puebla, May 5th, 1862. And by this time, the French general was pretty arrogant because he sees Mexico as just a ragtag army who's ill-equipped, especially compared to the French. At this time, um, many Europeans believe that the French um, holds, has the strongest military in the world. Um, they, they're, they're well-seasoned soldiers who have conquered Europe um, under Napoleon Bonaparte and his su successors. Um, they're a fierce fighting military, militaristic empire. And they come, they come, they come to Puebla, um, 6,000 French against 2,000 Mexicans. 6,000 well-equipped, well-trained, hardened warriors from France against 2,000 ill-trained, ill-equipped Mexicans. But this is, this is a lesson throughout history that oftentimes those who are defending their homeland have a lot, of course, a lot more to lose than those who are invading, right? And so they're defending their mothers, they're defending their children, they're defending their wives, they're defending their history. And we see this happen throughout time with the 300 against, um, the 300, 300 Spartans against um, the, the Persian Emperor Xerxes. We see it with the, the US rebels or the American rebels against the British Empire at Lexington, Lexington and Concord. We see it time and time again when invasionary forces come, come against freedom fighting um, rebels on their ho home turf who have something to lose and, and um, everything to gain by kicking these invaders out. So the Mexicans fight and they repel the French again and again at Puebla and the French general is forced to retreat. And even though this was not the decisive battle in, during the French invasion, this is the, the moment of hope. Um, the moment of hope and news spreads throughout, throughout Mexico and even Mexicans living within the conquered territories of California and Texas that this small group of Mexicans defeated the French at Puebla and um, Mexican American women in San Francisco write, write patriotic poems to, to, to the soldiers in, um, in Puebla after, the, after um, their, their victory over the French. So the, the event has profound um, symbolic significance to the Mexicans at that time and subsequent Mexicans throughout history and Mexican-Americans 
um, up until present day. It, let me see, what else? Is, do you have any other questions about that event? Um, a little bit more, but I was just gonna say, wow, I had no idea uh, the numbers behind it, how it was 2,000 against 6,000, that's insane. And I guess it really goes to show like when you put your heart into something and you have so much to lose, like you're not, you're gonna go all in for it and make sure that you're defending your honor and your ancestors and your family. So that's so, so, fascinating. Yeah, the, French le the French lost 500 men and the Mexicans only lost 100. Wow. This is a quote from V. Lorenz, which was the French general. Uh, right before he came uh, upon Puebla, this was his, his famous quote. We are so superior to the Mexicans in organization, race, that from this moment on, I can consider myself the owner of Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might as well at that rate that you're going. <laughs> um, thank you for that. That was very fascinating information, Dr. Fontes. Um, additionally, can you tell me a little bit more about why the Battle of Pe uh, Pueblo uh, was so important? It was so important because it was it was a symbolic win. This idea of David versus Goliath. If you know the Old Testament, right? This young, this young David who I think is like thirteen or fourteen in the Old Testament. He's a young boy and he goes against this giant who's like fifteen feet tall, and he and he, and he actually defeats the giant. And this is the story of the of Puebla, um, a small ragtag team of Mexican soldiers who are ill trained, ill equipped, fight Goliath and defeat defeat Goliath. And as I was saying before our interview, this is the last time that, that Americans, and when I say Americans, I mean everyone from the Western Hemisphere, right? From Alaska to Argentina, we are all Americans. This is the, really the last time that Americans fight off a European power. So this has significance, not only for Mexicans, but um, Americans living in the United States. This is the last time that Americans fight off um, a colonial power. Um, the French will eventually call more troops in and take over Mexico City. But in a few years, they're repelled. And Benito Juarez is, um, is back in the presidency. And in 18, I believe 1867, he declares Cinco de Mayo a national holiday. So it's, I, I think it's, it's a moment of hope. That's why it's so significant. A moment of hope that Mexico can defeat um, a superior power. And think about this, they, they, they had lost Texas a couple of decades before, they lost, Mexico lost half of its territory. Half of Mexico was taken by the United States. So people were living through great defeat during, during this time. And so the Battle of Puebla gives Mexicans hope that all was not lost, that they can rise up and defeat superior powers and be their own nation. No, yeah, that was beautiful. Um, because I like how you mentioned they have gone through so much desperation these past couple years with all the territory they have lost, and then they come back while they're the underdogs. They come back and really show like, hey, like this is who we are. We're going to fight for what we um, what for what we are as individuals as Mexicans. So mm -hmm. that's great. Thank you, Dr. Fontes. Welcome. Another reason why um, Cinco de Mayo um, enjoys widespread celebration in the late 19th century, not only because Benito Juarez in 1867 proclaims a national holiday, but at the battle, there's a young Lieutenant named Porfirio Diaz. And he was relatively unknown before the battle, but he becomes more popular because of the battle. And he is a dictator that reigns in Mexico from 1876 to 1911. So that was his defining moment and he is the dictator that the Mexican revolutionaries fight against, Zapata, Villa. He is, so he reigned, it's called the Porfiriato. His reign is called the Porfiriato. During that time, 1876 and 1911, um, Cinco de Mayo is celebrated throughout all of Mexico. It's most likely because of his influence, because this was his, his defining moment when um, he helped repel the French invaders and he was a national hero from that time on. Oh, thank you. I had never heard of him before. So, but I mean, obviously, once you, men when, men once you mentioned the uh, about Pancho Villa and stuff, it reminded me, okay, about that um, war. But thank you for that. So the next question I have for you is, so as you know, Cinco de Mayo is now celebrated across the United States 
And many of these celebrations do take place in ways that don't necessarily honor the history um, and quite frankly, use many cultural stereotypes. Um, so what are some ways in which people can celebrate this um, in which reflecting like the way it is uh, celebrated in Mexico and how can people celebrate in the United States in a way that truly honors the history and culture? Sure. So at, at one time during the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, Cinco de Mayo was a major holiday throughout Mexico and was celebrated in most, most cities and places with great fanfare, fireworks, fiestas, parades. But after the Mexican Revolution, it sort of, it sort of wanes during, in Mexico, but it, it has always been a, a, a big celebration in Mexico City and Puebla. Of course, Puebla has always carried the tradition on because that's where it occurred. As it wanes in Mexico, it gained significance in the United States. Even during the 1860s, along the border, single de Mayo is being celebrated by Mexicans along the border and in Los Angeles, San Francisco. In the 1920s, it, it's revived. As 10% of Mexicans leave Mexico and come to the United States, um, the Mexican government is concerned that all those Mexicans who are leaving Mexico will lose their Mexican identity, will forget about their heritage and history. And so together with the Mexican consulate in Los Angeles and Mexican American groups in places like Los Angeles and Fresno, they combine forces and say, why don't we um, initiate single to mile celebrations here. So every year Mexicans will remember their history. And so that's why today you hear people say, well, it's not even celebrated in Mexico. Well, this is the reason because it was revived in the United States for the specific reasons so that Mexican Americans remember their history. And so even today in Los Angeles, every year around 650,000 people show up to the Los Angeles single to mile. The second largest celebration and this is surprising to me, the second largest single de mile celebration in the United States is in Omaha, Nebraska. And every year around 200,000 people show up to that. And it's, it's been a very large event since the 1980s. Why, Although, um, oh, sorry, interrupt. Uh, why Omaha, Nebraska though? Like you said, I would have never suspected that. Because there's a Mexican American, you know, when, you, when you're looking at immigration, oftentimes immigrants who are far away from their homeland and are, and there's not any other people like them for miles and miles and miles, often, often their identity from their homeland becomes very, very solidified. And so perhaps the Mexicans in, in Nebraska celebrate single the mile for that reason that they wanna remember where they're from. You know, they're far away from the border. They're, they're, there, aren't, aren't, there aren't, aren't that many communities or in, in, in the Midwest, large Mexican American communities. And so, since the 80s, it's been a really large celebration. You know, over 200,000 people show up every year to their celebration. So it's the second largest in, in, in the United States. Pretty amazing. Yeah, I would have never imagined that. I was thinking like maybe San Francisco or something of that. Um, somewhere and, over there. And you, you can Google it. Um, they have a website, Google Omaha, Nebraska, Single de Mile Celebration. There's a fantastic website, website and gives oh. a history of Single de Mile celebrations in, 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 in their city. Oh, wow. I would have never known. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Did I answer that question? Yes. I was just going to ask if you could um, address a little bit more on how can people celebrate it here, like especially here in the Central Valley, if there's anything that um, you have done or you know about um, any locals, uh, their version of how to celebrate Cinco de Mayo. Uh, cold sure. so, yeah. so every year you can find some sort of Cinco de Mayo celebrations somewhere in the valley and especially if you want to take a drive to Los Angeles. I know every year for the last several years during Single de Mile there um, during Art Hop in downtown Fresno there's a there's a celebration artists get together and and um, paint or sculpt um, their representations of Single de Mile and Mexican culture. You just have to google these events um, but every city in around in the southwest has single de mile celebrations. Thank yeah. you for that. I didn't know Art Hop did that actually. So that was pretty interesting. Um, well, I just want to say thank you once again, Dr. Fontes. Um, I believe we can end it on that note. And as always, this has been another fascinating video providing great historical context on the subject of Cinco de Mayo. Thank you very much, Sienna. I really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. We appreciate you.
And to our campus community, I lastly just wanted to say happy Cinco de, Cinco de Mayo from Clovis Community College.